do Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Darlene True Christ, and I am the Community Engagement Manager for OOI, and we're really delighted to be able to present lightning talks this afternoon. Actually, it depends on where one is. <laughs> we learned that today. Um, so, uh, I will run through um, the presenters alphabetically, except with the exception of Bill Davis, who will be at the end because of technical issues. But um, I'm really happy to present Shima Ab Abadi from the University of Washington. Shima, you're up first. Fantastic. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Shima Abadi, and this work is uh, sponsored by Office of Naval Research. Uh, we are going to use the broadband hydrophones, uh, the OI broadband hydrophones, to analyze um, ocean ambient noise. Uh, in this particular project, we looked at rain and wind noise. We took rain um, measurements and wind speeds from the OI surface buoys, and then we analyzed the noise recorded by broadband hydrophones um, co-located with the surface buoys, but at the sea, uh, sea level. Um, we developed a Python toolbox, OOI Pi, um, that helps scientists to analyze OOI broadband hydrophone data. We realized that we don't have such thing and people may, may use that for further analysis. Uh, what you see, I have two examples of a spectrograms generated by OI Pi. Uh, the top one, only, so what you see is on the um, right hand side. The top panel is a uh, sample wind noise. You see a background, uh, background noise level is increased. And the bottom one is a sample rain noise. So you see some spikes um, and it's not, um, it's not uniform in a spectrum. Uh, we have analyzed, uh, um, Gosh, it's more than 11,000 hours of data. Um, and uh, so what you see on the uh, middle panel is noise recorded during rain, rain events. And on the left panel, you see noise during um, when we only have wind. So we manually uh, took the marine mammals, ship noise, and everything else uh, out of the data. Um, just keep it short. That's it. If uh, we will have some papers. Uh, uh, on this analysis shortly. Um, so you can take a look if you want to know more about the project. Thank you very much, Shima. And we will have time for questions after. Next is Rachel Eveleth of Oberlin College. Rachel, here you go. Hello. Um, as Darlene said, my name is Rachel Eveleth. I'm an assistant professor of geology at Oberlin College. Uh, I first got involved with OI in an education capacity through the data labs development workshops. Um, since then, I have implemented several of these labs in my introductory oceanography class in both in-person and remote settings. And I'm always happy to share resources and swap ideas. So please get in touch. Um, starting this summer through the Rutgers-led OOI Virtual REU, I have also incorporated OOI data into my research program, and I've now worked with five undergraduates in a virtual setting, um, training students how to analyze OOI data in Python. And our team has quantified the magnitude of CO2 flux at both the Endurance and Pioneer arrays, and have shown that while both regions are net annual sinks of comparable size, the drivers of the seasonal cycle on these shelves differ, with the Atlantic shelf being more thermally driven than the Pacific shelf. Um, further, we have investigated the influence of upwelling and eddies driving CO2 burps into the atmosphere at the event scale. Um, and I direct you to the posters listed at the bottom of the slide here for more detail and please email with any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next up is Eric Fredrickson, um, also of the University of Washington. Eric, you're on. Thanks, Darlene. Yeah, I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the, the School of Oceanography at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm working on a couple of projects uh, utilizing the OOI uh, cable array. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, one of these projects is looking at uh, 
the inflation behavior of axial seamount. So the, the plot in the upper left um, is from Bill Chadwick's blog, and then it shows pressure data from the central caldera showing the reinflation of that reinflation of axial since the eruption in 2015. Um, and you'll notice that these uh, that this in inflation pattern is interrupted occasionally by these short-term deflation events. Um, so I'm looking at the pressure and tilt data that are available uh, on the cable array um, to study these short-term deflation events and do some forward modeling um, of movement on the ring faults, uh, transport of magma, things like that to try to understand what's going on um, during these uh, short-term deflation events. So if you wanna know more about that, um, you can check out Bill Chadwick's um, uh, poster, which I point out in the bottom, bottom left side. Um, and then the second project is on the right, right half of the screen. Um, and we have an independent um, PI run sensor uh, also installed uh, on the cable array at Axial. Um, and the sensor is a uh, three axis accelerometer um, with three orthogonal channels that we use as a tilt meter that's capable of correcting its own drift. Um, and so the concept here is pretty straightforward. Um, the, an acceler the accelerometer in the horizontal um, essentially measures an acceleration of G sine theta, where G is the, the local gravity. Um, and so you can rearrange that to get, to get the sense of tilt. And for small angles, um, your, uh, that, that, that horizontal angle or that tilt is essentially, um, uh, uh, sorry, given, given by that equation there. And, and, and uh, in the vertical, um, you kind of have the, the opposite situation because your measured gravity is gonna be G cosine theta, which is essentially G for small angles. Um, so the idea is that you can periodically rotate your horizontal channels into the vertical to get a very accurate measure of gravity. And you use that to calibrate the sensor through time. Um, so in the bottom left hand, uh, I have that multi-panel plot and that's just showing the linearity um, of this drift through time for about two months of data for the various channels. Um, and we see that there's a drift on the order of about um, a, a few tens of, of microradians per year. Uh, and then in the bottom right hand side, I just show some example time series of uh, applying those drift corrections uh, to the tilt data in the east and, east and north directions. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. That was great. Next up is Matthew Lobo of Portland State University. Matthew, here you go. No, this is Natalie Freeman's. I'm so sorry. That's all right, Darlene. And Natalie is from the University of Colorado, Boulder. My apologies. Oh, you're fine. Yes, hi, I'm Natalie, a postdoc at Colorado Boulder. I work with Donata Giglio on air-sea interaction. Um, in particular, we're interested in high-frequency wind variability, so think gusty or intermittent winds. Um, and high-frequency winds have proved difficult to characterize in the past um, and resulted in a in an incomplete understanding of air sea interac interaction across the globe. So our group is funded as part of um, the NASA Ocean Vector Wind Science Team to better characterize these high frequency winds and work toward getting a better understanding of the impact of high frequency winds on the upper ocean um, physical processes. So we ultimately plan to run idealized wind experiments using a 1D process model, but first we're utilizing data from OOI's Southern Ocean Apex surface mooring that's located in the Southeast Pacific um, to examine the model's fitness in this region of interest. So the stormy Southern Ocean is this perfect natural laboratory for stormy conditions, high frequency winds, um, so measurements from both the bulk meteorology package um, and the cabled CTDs at depth are being used uh, from this array to initialize and force the model. Um, so think variables like winds, air temperature, seawater salinity, temperature, um, and so on. And it's also being used as a diagnostic of the model's performance, um, which is depicted in these two figures. Um, so is the model losing too much heat? Is it mixing too little? Things like that. Um, so big thanks to, to you all at OOI um, for providing this data. And I'll be going into much more detail um, of these, uh, this work, especially these figures that I didn't touch on. Um, and uh, my poster is on Monday, December 14th. Great, thank you, Natalie. And now Matthew Lobo of Portland State University is up. Um, okay, uh, thank you. 
Yes, yeah, so my name is Matt Lobo and I'm an undergraduate at Portland State. Um, I was working with Dr. Ed Zarin until recently. He just uh, transferred to OSU. He mainly does satellite altimetry stuff. Um, so this was kind of random for him as well, at least the start of it. Um, I guess I'll just go through the figures really quickly. So the one on the left just shows um, uh, theoretical modes um, that are orthogonal to each other uh, with the dotted lines. And these can just be calculated from um, climato climatological means of temp and salinity um, and uh, boundary conditions. And then the solid lines show the um, vertical normal modes that I was able to derive um, using a different form of the, than the classical EOF analysis. Um, and it shows pretty close agreement. This is for, I think, the U component of velocity in the Southern Ocean. Um, but similar results were obtained for V components and then also for the Argentine Basin. Um, and then specifically what we were looking at was uh, at different frequencies, so sub versus super inertial frequencies. Um, and that's shown in this middle figure. Um, you can see a, a strong tidal signal. And there were other signals that um, you know, we could say with less confidence, we're also uh, tidal. The, the N2 alias is the, is the other uh, bump you see. Um, but anyways, so what we were doing with this is um, we were constructing these vertical normal modes to compare, especially what's going on at the surface, to satellite altimetry data. And the point uh, behind doing that is because if we can link these two independent sources of data, one day we might be able to infer what's happening at the surface, or throughout the whole water column, excuse me, by knowing what's happening at the surface. Um, and there are a lot of people that are interested in this, and this has been a problem for a long time. I think uh, there's a really famous paper by Carl Wunsch from 1997 that kind of started the, the conversation about this. Um, and so uh, another important thing that this shows is that by using wire filing profilers, we're able to construct these high resolution vertical normal modes. Um, which is actually kind of harder than you think, because if you think about, if you're interested in like a tidal signal, let's say, and it takes the wire filing profiler five hours to go from top to bottom. Um, if you try to say that this represents, you know, a concurrent profile, then imagine you're interested in like a tidal signal that's going to be look like it's almost 180 degrees out of phase because, you know, it was, it was, let's say it was, you know, at the max here, then it's almost at the mid when it gets to the bottom. So you can't use the classical, uh, you know, covariance matrix for EOF analysis. Um, so it does require some um, a, a special approach, but you can do something, you know, by calculating a time lag, and then you have a cross spectral density matrix, which is the equation you see up there. Um, and then as long as the signal stays locked in the vertical, you can assume uh, that the cross spectra amplitude is all the um, the shared power between two signals, and um, and yeah. And I think that that's pretty much it. Ed and I should have a publication out on this in the nearest future. He's finishing up stuff with satellite data, um, but it'll show exactly what features of these normal modes we were interested in and how we connected them to the satellite data. Um, and if you do have any questions or any follow-up interests, please feel free to contact me. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. That was great, Matt. And um, please apprise us of your paper. Next is Aaron Mao of the University of South Carolina. Hello, everybody. Yeah, as introduced, I am Aaron Mao of the University of South Carolina, um, and I, I study hydrothermal uh, environments with my uh, my PI Susan Lang. Um, but what I'm presenting today is is something that happened earlier this year, which was the revolution re or this this evolution of of uh, how the OOI data is made available. Um, in particular, there is a data viewer um, that has been uh, re-released. I think in February is exactly when it was was sort of unveiled, but. Um, um, as an instructor, um, I was able to work in 2018 presenting um, OOI data to undergraduates, um, sort of as a student first, and then as a uh, as a as a TA. Um, and in the flowcharts that I have on the left, it, there's a lot of different sticking points um, that existed before the data uh, the data the current data viewer existed. And in particular, uh, one that people tended to get stuck on was this term called a reference designator, which almost required you to be an engineer to truly understand how to use. Um, the current flowchart or the current uh, framework that's been established enables you to not only skip almost all of the steps that are involved in, in acquiring your data, but um, is more visually focused. And as such, it lends itself more, um, more easily to undergraduates who are more interested in looking at things like temperature parameters or whatever. Um, and if I move on to uh, sort of the figures that are over on the right, um, it, it's sort of going into the interest that undergrads have in, um, in, in data. 
And curiosity is very high, at least in the undergraduate realm um, that, that I teach um, at areas like axial seamount. Um, so these hydrothermal environments. What we have with the OOI data is perhaps one of the only um, long term, so six years or more of, of data sets of, that are continuous um, at an active hydrothermal vent field. So uh, what I have over on the right is an illustration of, of sort of how we were able to take that data and translate it into or how to not only download it, but translate it into MATLAB and be able to pull out different signals. Um, so as we saw on, on, uh, on the previous slide, there was power spectral density, which I have given um, on the bottom right, and that's able to pull out different signals. And these are from temperature sensors at the ashes vent field. Um, and just sort of in summary, um, the data is, is very easily uh, identified visually. Um, so as such, it lends itself much better to undergraduate exploration. So if they have uh, particular interests that they're looking at, it's very easy for them to find what they want to look at, where they want to look at it. Um, and then it's able to be downloaded very quickly. Um, having things like annotations available online for them helps you minimize the amount of QAQC that you need to do, um, which means that you're able to start working with the data faster. So you're able to emphasize your teaching objectives. Um, and then finally, again, this is perhaps one of the few, if not the only um, live um, continuous time series that are available at things like a hydrothermal environment. Um, and that's very important if you're interested in doing any sort of modeling or predictions. Um, it, for a lot of other data sets, it's, it's just periods of like just year, you get one data point. Um, so having continuous geochemical sensors is very, very valuable. And thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Again, another great one. Um, next up is Chris Russinello of the West Virginia University. Chris? Chris, are you here? Maybe we'll, we'll go on to William Wilcox of the University of Washington. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Um, so at the University of Washington, we have a, um, a fairly small undergraduate program, but it's um, one that with about 30 majors per year that really highlights experiential learning. And part of the program in, in, in comprises um, seagoing data collection and analysis projects in both the sophomore and the senior year. And those are generate a lot of excitement amongst the students, but because the ship only can go to one place and it's usually wherever it is because of um, sort of NSF driven science, um, there's sometimes a limited selection of projects. Um, so this year, because of COVID, we can't use the Thompson for the senior project. So that's been disappointing for the students in one sense that they can't go out to sea and have a fun experience. But in another sense, it's really liberating because we can work on anything provided we can find some data. And of the students in the class, there are about seven who are working with data from the OOI cabled array and also from the Ocean Networks Canada Neptune array. Um, and we've been developing proposals in the fall and we'll actually be analyzing data mostly in the winter. Um, but there's a bunch of really exciting projects. We have two students who are looking for correlations between hydrothermal perturbations measured by resistivity and temperature sensors with earthquakes, trying to understand processes that occur in the hydrothermal heat uptake zone near the magma chambers of the Endeavour and Axial Seamount. Um, we have one student who's looking at um, ocean current data um, from axial sea amount, particularly trying to see whether the currents and the turbulence was affected by some the 2015 eruption. And that's using data that I don't think anybody's really looked at very hard. And then there are several students who are looking at blue and fin whales, the seismometers and hydrophones record amazing data sets of blue and fin whales. And blue whales have, have had apparently fairly constant populations over the past sort of decade, whereas fin whales are recovering. So we wait, we're trying to see whether that's reflected in the number of calls. And we're also looking at um, to see whether the calling patterns are evolving in the same ways that have been seen by previously in Southern California. Um, don't know how these projects are gonna go. It's a very compressed analysis um, interval, but it, it is great to have really good tools to look at the data and we've downloaded the data and we're searching for tools to analyze it. 
it's fun for me because I do everything in MATLAB, but we decided to switch all us undergraduates to learning Python. So it's a great opportunity for me to sort of explore another language. So in three or four months, I'll have a really good idea how well this went, but hopefully it'll go well. Thank you, William. And he has another. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a bit different. Um, about 30 months ago, there was a workshop held at the University of Washington on resident underwater vehicles. And I was just a participant, not one of the organizers. And they generated a workshop report that's shown at the bottom there. And the idea of resident AUVs is you can have an autonomous underwater vehicle that you leave at a site, um, ideally with a power source so it can recharge and connectivity so that you can download data and program missions. And the reason for this is there are some processes in the oceans that are very dynamic, that occur quite quickly and they're unpredictable. So it's hard to observe them from a ship and it's often hard to observe them with static sensors. So you would like a, a vehicle that you can actually go to where the action is. Um, and the example on the right hand side is the one that's sort of closest to me. That's um, the eruption at Axial. Or axial Seamount erupted in 2015. Um, we're waiting to, for it to erupt again. We don't know when that will occur, but hopefully in the next few years. Um, and when that happens, we can detect with the seismic network very quickly where the eruption's going on, where magma's erupting on the sea floor. But we hopefully it won't occur where the um, cabled array is because that would actually knock it out. So it will probably be somewhere else. And it would great, be great to be able to go there. Um, there are some questions related to um, how heat release, the chemical, how chemicals are released and how that impacts microbial communities. Um, other ideas for, um, you know, why you might want an RAUV are trying to observe sediment flows, trying to observe instability of gas hydrates, some um, problems related to animal migration, the development of thin layers of phytoplankton, um, hypoxia events, and also the opening of um, leads in sea ice are all things that are quite hard to observe and where you would like to be able to have mobile assets to observe them. Um, as a result of this workshop, there was a mid-scale um, research infrastructure uh, proposal that went to NSF. Um, it was very ambitious and it didn't get funded, um, but I'm just here to say that um, I don't think this idea is going away. The technology for resident autonomous underwater vehicles is rapidly emerging. There are big commercial drivers from things like surveying pipelines, surveying commercial wind farms, where the regulators require that's done periodically, where you can potentially do it a lot more economically if you can have an AUV doing it um, without ship support. Um, and so I think the technology is going to continue to make this more doable. And I think the OI, OI um, cabled array is the, an ideal environment to develop this. And the central figure just shows some examples of what could be done at Axial Seamount. You could deploy a fairly small acoustic transponder network, which would also be very useful for geodesy. Um, you could start interacting with ship deployed AUVs from that, controlling them, showing you could control them from land. You could potentially, without having an, a complex docking capability, you could moor an AUV there and just have a vehicle that just sort of was in sleep mode and could just respond once when something like an eruption happened. Should also point out that the cabled array extends onto the margin. And there's a lot of interest in having autonomous mapping capabilities for sub, uh, understanding subduction zone hazards. So it may well be that this could be developed at Hydrate Ridge too. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Guan Yu Zhu of the University of Washington. And I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Please do correct me. And um, you're on. Hey, uh, actually, your pronunciation is pretty good. Um, <laughs> my name is Guang Yixi. I'm a research scientist at uh, APL UW. Uh, my slide here is a brief summary of the, the major data products coming from the, uh, the COVID project. Uh, so COVID is an imaging sonar that is designed to monitor uh, seafloor hydrothermal discharge. Uh, it is currently installed on the OI RCA observatory at the Ashes Bank Field on Axial Seamount. Um, the instrument was initially deployed in summer 2018, but uh, soon afterwards, um, COVID suffered a broken cable. 
Uh, so we had to put it out in summer 2019. But we managed to fix the problem and, and redeploy it one month later. Uh, so, so far, COVID has been uh, operating and uh, collecting data since July 2019. Um, so when operating uh, in a normal schedule, uh, COVID operates in two major modes. The first one is the imaging mode, which is shown in the central column of, of this slide. So in this mode, the sonar head is uh, uh, pitched up and down to scan a three-dimensional volume that encompasses the hydrothermal plume that we're interested in. Uh, by processing the, the backscatter data recorded in this mode, we can create three-dimensional acoustic images of the hydrothermal plumes. Uh, some examples are shown in the animation at the bottom. So which shows the, the acoustically imaged uh, hydrothermal plume rising from the most vigorous vent uh, within our study area. So as you can see, the, the plume varies with time, uh, primarily uh, a bends towards the downstream direction ambient currents. In addition to these uh, uh, 3D acoustic images, uh, COVID also produces a series of 2D maps of hydrothermal anomalies near the sea floor. So the data recorded uh, uh, for uh, these kind of maps are, are in the so-called diffuse flow mode. So when operating in, in this mode, the sonar head is pitched downward to look at the sea floor. Uh, but in order to maximize the spatial coverage of the sonar, we also pan the sonar head to look at like three different sections of the sea floor periodically. Um, so, so some example maps are shown in the animation at the bottom. Um, as you can see that the, the red color uh, indicates area that, that are potentially uh, covered by hydrothermal discharge. Um, so by, by looking at the temporal variation of those uh, red, reddish areas uh, in, in the maps, so we can, we can use uh, such a time series, uh, such a time series of maps to study the temporal variation of the spatial distribution hydrothermal sources and also their intensity with uh, the, the, the variation of the intensity with time. Uh, okay, uh, before I wrap up, uh, if, if you're interested in our research, uh, please check out our newly launched instrument website. Uh, so a link to the web page is, is included at the bottom of the slide. And also we're presenting a virtual poster next Wednesday. So, so please stop by and, and, and leave questions in the chat session. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I love those animations, they're great. If everyone would just give me a moment, I'm going to pull up Bill Davis's um, presentation, which I was unable to do. Let's see. No, I Sorry, folks. There we go. You get to see my messiness. Okay, Bill Davis. Hi. Um I'm Bill Davis, and I'm the founder and CEO of an e-commerce company, beachnecessities.com. So I am the non-scientist in the group, uh, but have been looking at ocean sustainability for quite a while now and uh, building familiarity with the OOI data. So wanted to take a minute to look at how uh, leveraging OOI and other data sets can help us better understand the ocean because I think there's a lot, uh, lot here that we don't know yet. Um, first, uh, do we really know more about space than the deep ocean? Uh, and there's a strong point to be made that we do. Um, we've put 12 people on the moon. We put over 550 people into space, yet we've only taken, I think it's four people who've descended to Mariana's Trench. So um, if you read this, how stuff works, It'll basically say we've mapped uh, using sonar less than 1% of the ocean. And this is 70% of the Earth's surface. 
So we've got a good we got a good bit of work to do to get a better understanding of what's going on here. Um, next, luckily, uh, we're about to turn the corner on the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. That'll kick off in January. Um, great opportunity over the next decade to level the playing field uh, and really develop, uh, I think, a, a much deeper knowledge of the ocean. Um, and I raise that particularly. Um, Actually, next. So I raise that um, because we know that climate change is impacting the ocean. We know that the ocean is a primary source of life on this planet and that this is already impacting humanity in meaningful ways and will continue to do so. So if we are going to manage this, if we are going to be able to address the impacts of climate change we, with some level of competency, we need to better understand what's going on. And for that, it's going to require data. I think we, you know, we have a good understanding. We, we you know, we, but in, in reality, there's a lot more to be done here. We really don't understand everything that's going on, particularly when you, you know, change, um, you mix ocean acidification with sea level rise, what's happening to reefs, what's happening to fisheries. And when you put all these things into a stew together, what's the impact? You know, you've got glaciers melting, uh, carbon levels increasing. You know, what's, if you take everything together, it's gonna to be really challenging to paint that big picture. And for that, we're gonna need more data. So um, there's a, I just like to say, you know, in God we trust, all others bring data. Um, lastly, uh, and just thought this was uh, uh, highly relevant, it, uh, this is an article from EOS from last month that it seems that, you know, consistently data uh, sets aren't being cited in research. It was surprising to me, you know, I, anything, you know, I starting back in papers in junior high, I always had to footnote something, you know, if I was referencing it. So if data sets aren't being referenced, um, you know, how do we know? What, 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 how do you know the validity of the points being made? So it's just a, a you know, let, let's make sure that data sets are being referenced, um, particularly the OOI data set. So, you know, this is one that uh, it seems like this is, I think it was Aaron, you mentioned, this is the longest running continuous data set available. You know, why aren't we, you know, if, if this is the best available data and it appears to be, again, that's a layman's perspective, you know, why, how do we grow usage? Uh, and particularly in, in my interests, I understand in, in science, um, but I look at the business world and I think of businesses. So you look at sea, sea level rise, we've got billions, tens of billions of dollars of real estate that is coastally based. What's gonna happen? How are we gonna manage uh, that? We've got fisheries that are first off being overfished, but then with ocean acidification and warming waters, what's happening to those fisheries? You know, that's, that's not only billion dollar industries, but we've also are dealing with, you know, food that feeds billions of people. How are we gonna to start to manage these issues? So that, that's my two bits. And uh, if anyone wants to, I don't know if I can answer any of the questions, but if anybody at least wants to have a conversation, uh, you know, feel free to reach out, uh, happy to talk about it. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, what you brought to the forefront is all really thought provoking and worthy of discussion. So thank you. So um, now we have plenty of time for questions. I'll check the chat box. Um, I'll, re well, I'll read these, um, but we can move forward by you know, raising our hand. There's a few of us here, so we can really just unmute and talk. Oh. Question for do Dr. Wilcock, will students student projects using OOI data be presented to the general public next spring? And the answer is I actually um, don't know. Um, uh, the, one of the requirements of the res research project, which will be completed at the end of winter quarter, so it will be the end of March, is the students do give presentations. Those have always been in person on a sort of Friday afternoon event that just people in the school attended. I suspect we're still gonna be um, online. Um, so, I, but I don't know whether it'll be open to the general public, but I think that's not a bad idea. So I will suggest that I can't imagine 
that will be a hostile audience and people may want their <laughs> parents to come and <laughs> listen as well as some interested people. The other thing is that the reports do um, get um, archived in the UW Libraries Research Works database. And I was desperately trying to search around to figure out where they are, but there is an oceanography collection and they're in there. So they will appear there in the spring as well. But I can certainly, if this goes live, I can let the OI know, know and so that they can send out an announcement that people can watch. Oh, please do. Um, we'll do. That would be great. And we can share it through the network as well. Okay. Al Pluteman has his hand raised, Al. Thanks, Darlene. Uh, and thanks everybody, great. Thanks for doing this great stuff. I think I have a question for like every speaker, but I'm, I'll see if I can just do a, uh, rip through three of them really quick. I think they're simple questions. Uh, for Shima, did you, you, you talked about the buoy data. Did you use rain data from the um, met centers on the buoys? Yes. Okay, I thought so. You probably said that, but I, I missed it. Um, Natalie, you talked about a 1D column model, I think. What, um, what model are you testing? The, I'm unmuted now. The general ocean turbulence model got them. Uh, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And um, Rachel, this one's maybe a little not such an easy yes no answer, but the my sense was that the coastal ocean being a source or a sink of CO2 averaged uh, you know over a year, say, was not so clear whether it was really source or sink, and there wasn't much information to refute that or confirm it. And I'm just, you stated it fairly matter of factly, you know, like, well, we figured it out, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> um, do you, were you surprised? I mean, is this a pretty remarkable result perhaps? Um, I wouldn't say that it's remarkable, but maybe, I don't know, science modesty. Um, I, there are several studies um, that show that both of these shelves generally serve as sinks. Um, so I wasn't surprised the value, and, and it's a fairly small sink. We're talking about, um, it's like 1.5 moles of carbon per year, per meter squared per year. So it's a, a fairly small sink. And, and I think part of the reason why, um, why we haven't uh, come to full consensus on, on how the shelves are behaving um, is because there is so much variability. There's a ton of spatial variability um, and uh, we don't have much data, right? So that there isn't a lot of continuous CO2 data. Um, these CO2 sensors on the mooring are still um, fairly new. We have some questions about quality control that we're trying to kind of cross-check with, with ship data. Um, so um, it's an exciting data set to explore and we've got a little bit more quality control to do and we have some thinking to do about, about how much we can extrapolate our understanding at these particular stations to a broader spatial area. Great, thanks. That's, yeah, really helpful answer. Thanks a lot. Anyone else have questions? Doesn't look like it. Well. I added one into the chat. Uh, it was for oh, Dr. Sorry. Wilcock, but I guess anyone at UW. Uh, and the, it was just trying to understand. So I used to live in Seattle, uh, just moved down to Portland a couple of years ago. So our data visualization tool, what types of data visualization tools are used, if any, to you know look at the OOI data? Like there was a fairly prominent software tool in Seattle Tableau. And I would assume UW's got you know, a, a university-wide license. So I'm just curious is what, what sort of data visualization tools are available or being used um, to access and, and review the OOI data? Who wants to take that? <laughs> I, this is William. I'm probably not the best person to answer that question because most of my work is with seismic data and then, um, we, there are established um, sort of seismic tools to visualize that. Um, but I don't know, maybe Gwen, you could answer it, but my dog's going crazy. So I'm probably gonna have to mute myself. But. Okay. 
Because I know, uh, I'm trying to think, he's the former chair of the computer science department who had an, uh, he was kind of, had an assistant professorship over in oceanography, Ed Lazowska. So I know there's a connection between the computer science department at UW and the oceanography school. So that's where I'm, and the same thing with cloud computing, given the, the, you know, Seattle's, you know, where two of the major cloud uh, companies are based with Amazon and Microsoft, you know, is there, I'm just trying to understand sort of the technical infrastructure, you know, is, I mean, given the amount of data that OOI is generating, what's being used. I don't, I don't know if they do it for Tableau, but here's, there you yeah, go. Yeah, and I know there's an e-science program that Ed Lazowska, I think, started. And there are people working in that to look at various aspects of this, da this data, but I'm not really the right person. So I think you're correct that there are a lot of tools to look at this data, that um, there are different people developing them. I don't know whether Guang Yu might be able to comment if he's because he's actually doing some pretty neat visualizations of his data. Actually, the, the, the code that we use to visualize the, the sonar data are all written by ourselves, so they're, they're not commercial, and, and also they're pretty hard for anyone else to understand, but myself, it's because it's poorly commented. Um, but but you still I remember someone presented a new like online portal, the, the new OI data portal that has a pretty advanced like uh, visualization function building in it. It's called like a data viewer. So maybe that's something you can check out. And that's Axiom's doing that work? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to also add, my undergraduates are using Python um, to do this. And there's a lot of great tools that are being developed to, um, to access OI data into Python. Um, Saj uh, Lichtenheimer, who was on this call, I think he's left now, recently released an OI um, Python toolbox that is really great. Um, and I just put that in the chat um, for those that are interested in getting started and using Python uh, with OI data. And that's, I'm, I'm abstracting a layer up, you know, when you're down in the code specifically, you know, that there's a different level of technical proficiency by abstracting it up into commercial software tools, you know, it just makes it more available. I mean, there's just not, majority of people just don't understand Python and, uh, you know, aren't going to go through the effort of, of learning it. You know, how do we, how do you bring it up in something that's, you know, what I would say is potentially readily, more readily available or easier, which is, let's be honest, people are lazy. Well, Bill, on Friday at 11 a.m., Craig Rizian is going to demonstrate the Data Explorer, the new data tool, and show how to make data views. So you might want to tune into that. I just want to add the hydrophone data because it's huge. It's not available on the data viewer, so you cannot use that for hydrophone data. We use Python and we have our own toolbox to visualize the acoustic data. Um, but in terms of cloud computing, we are using Microsoft Azure uh, Cloud for uh, analyzing long-term uh, hydrophone data. They have they work with University eScience Center that people uh, put okay. in the chat box. So they've worked with you know, uh, faculties to provide um, some grants for compute, um, compute time. Okay. And are you saying that the data set's so large that you need to have, because it's, everyone's got these custom tools and the more custom tool, you know, it's everyone solves a problem for what they need. It's trying to find something. Is there, are there tools available that could be more widely used? It sounds like the data set you're using is so large, Shima, that you've had to develop your own custom. Yeah, I think the OI uh, data portal or data viewer uh, is cannot visualize uh, a couple of data sets like broadband hydrophone data is one of them. Uh, digital high definition video recording is also the other one. Uh, there should be one more that I forgot because yes, the data is, uh, uh, it's, it's a big data set so they cannot use that. Okay. okay. That's how do we free the data? That, that's what my interest is in this is how do we free it so that more and more people can consume it? So that's it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else? A couple of things I'd really like to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to do this. It was most instructive and fascinating. You're really doing great science. 
And I would direct you to, we're hosting a virtual happy hour on Friday at six. And although it's not a typical AGU where we could sit across the room and have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee together, I'd like you to invite you to the virtual happy hour. So at least you have a chance to network with your colleagues and have a more informal session than all of these Zoom calls. <laughs> so <laughs> with that, I've recorded it and I'll post it online so you can share it with your friends, family and colleagues and really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Have a good Thanks. night. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Charlene. My pleasure. Thank you.